black and brown family take the time right now to do whatever you got to do get your libations if you have not already um do whatever you have to do to get yourself situated because we're gonna have a you know what the church folks call it we're gonna have a come to jesus meeting today the people who are actually the elders in the church used to say that back in the day we're gonna have that meeting today because we gotta have that meeting and there's no way for me to have this conversation unless we have that meeting and ain't nothing i can do about it now listen i want you to go if you if you if you don't get the newsletter go to breakingbrown.com you can get the newsletter there you can make a one-time donation you can make a cyclical donation once a month you can do the same thing at patreon.com slash y carnell you can do that all but i gotta get i gotta get to what i'm talking about tonight because i don't want anybody to fall asleep okay and i understand that i'm a little bit late so what i have to do i have to get to what i want to talk about and I want to dispel something. You see, one of the things that I'm critical of myself about, because I take inventory, and I'm critical of myself as well as other people are critical of me. So I take inventory, and sometimes one of the things that I am most guilty of, I will skim over a subject. I'll skim over it, and I won't go into depth. And last episode, I think, in terms of color of law, really and truthfully, my people, if you have not gotten this book, I need you to... Everybody ask about a Breaking Brown reading list. You got to get this book. If you don't get any other book right now, you got to get Color of Law. Because I talked about it a little bit, but I didn't get into it. I didn't really get into it. So, one of the people have been saying a lot, well, Yvette, you know, you... there. This is just a fill of... This is, this is just beef that, that, that people have in t between... You know, the, the, the people who believe in black entrepreneurship and the people who believe in politics, and they both go together. And we can all exist at the same time and kumbaya and everything will be fine if we all come together. And I'm telling you that that's not true. But I have not gotten to the crux of why it is not true, right? I've kind of said it. I've covered different issues. I've said there's no black 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 entrepreneurship without without black politics. And I've, I've, I've done a little bit of that, but I haven't brought it home. And I realize that I haven't brought it home. So when I realize that I haven't brought it home, I have to ask myself, like, why? Like, I've been doing this show for a minute. Why haven't I brought it home? And one of the things that I realized, one of the things that occurred to me in terms of why I haven't brought it home, there's a lie. A lie in there somewhere. So in order to bring this whole thing home, you have to find the lie. You have to figure out somebody's telling a lie about what it means to be black or somebody is telling a lie about how blackness and black failure was built. So I have to get into that and figure out what the lie is. Well, see, here's the thing. One of the... And, and this, is, this, this, this is how... This is what's undergirding this whole thing. We have this idea of race in America as this sort of static thing. America's always been racist. They ain't going to never be right by black people. That's just the end of it. It's a bunch of racist people here, and that's what we got to deal with. This kind of static image of what America is and what America should be uh, and, and was never and slavery now, and it's the same thing, except... There's something, there's a small thing in there that's a lie. And, 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 and in order to fully understand the failure of black people in this country as a race of people, we have to understand one thing. We have to understand what that lie is and get to the crux of that lie and pull that joint out. That's what we have to do. Now, let me tell you, well, what's the lie, Yvette? What's the lie? What is, what is the untruth in this? What's going on, Breaking Brown family? I see y'all in the chat. What's going on is this. We have this idea that there were, you know, racist individuals. So when we think of just the KKK, or when we think of, you know, um, somebody say he didn't want to live next to, to a black person or whatever, we see what built America or the racism in America is just some amount of racist some racist people who don't want to be bothered with us. That's kind of how we tend to see it. This is wrong. Because what you see if you read this book, Color of Law, 
is that the entire United States of America weaponized itself against African American descendants of slaves. This is not a person. This is a government that consistently, through Eisenhower, Hoover, uh, FDR, your favorite liberal, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, all of these people, all of these presidents, put in place policies that segregated us in such a way that prevented us from having access to what made us American. This is not an individual thing. This is your government turning against its citizens and turning against the Constitution and saying even though we promised you now that you had a 14th Amendment, that you have constitutional rights, we as a government are going to strip that away from you. Now see, understand one thing. What that says is that when you look at this thing and you see that this was not built by individuals, one thing that you should, if you have a mind, one thing that you should understand is something that is not built by individuals cannot be fixed by individual effort. You cannot fix what the United States of, of, of America did. Because see, one of the things that we have to understand, and I'm about to get into some specifics, but one of the things that we have to understand is that white people didn't even build their own wealth in this country, and they white. So if they did not build their own wealth in this country, how do you think as a subjugated group that has, that has as its enemy for so long the United States government that we're going to build our own. See, this has never been an individual thing. This has always been America versus the slaves that they freed and then and then weaponized. Now, understand, well, what are you talking about, Yvette? Well, let me just put up, let me just let me just show you something real quick. You know, one of the things when I say things are not static, we had after the at, you know, Reconstruction was interesting in a certain way, right? Reconstruction was interesting because we started electing black officials in ways in which we really hadn't seen. We started electing all these black people. And you see what, when you look back at the period before the federal government abandoned us as part of a deal to appease racist white people in the South and racist white leaders and, and policies in the South, what you see is black people were moving. We were moving up. And so in that, you see what could have been. You see the success that could have been had our own government not turned on us. You see that, you see that government, and let me just say one thing. People say, well, yeah, government let it happen. No, government did it. We need to be very clear. Government didn't let anything happen. Government wasn't just, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 complicit. Government did this to us. The most powerful government not only made us slaves, but when we were freed, we weren't really freed. And they allowed, not only allowed, but they had their own policies, which were racist, which violated our constitutional rights as citizens. So when you hear me talk about immigrants, understand that immigrants are able to come into this country and get, in terms of housing and access, stuff that we as citizens still do not have full access to. Right? So under, let, let's, we, we're going to go all the way back. See, I was reading, I have always, you all know that I was reading that uh, Haywood book about, you know, what was it, Communists and the Freedom Struggle, Harry Haywood. You all who've been watching me also know that, um, you know, I've read, I've read some Langston Hughes and all these people. And one of the things that always strikes me when I read these people is that they talk about growing up. A lot of them, not all of them, but in mixed neighborhoods. So I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, are you telling me that like America hasn't always been this way? America hasn't always been white people over here, black people over here, like, no, they had this, you know, uh, in the Haywood book, he talks about how a lot of the butlers, who, the black butlers, married white women, because the white, the white women that they married worked as maids where they worked, so there were all these little mixed babies running around, and you don't hear about that, but there's a reason that you don't hear about that, and that's because the government, Lexa Hughes said the same thing about having a little Jewish girlfriend or something, 
But you don't hear about that anymore. And I think the reason you don't hear about it because you don't hear about it because if we're honest about it, we have to go back and look and the, the, what the color of law points out very clearly. And let me just put it up, the book, because you got you to gotta go get the book. It, what it points out very clearly is that there were these mixed communities that had mixed up black and white, whether it was European immigrant or whatever, and were living peacefully until the government came in and intervened. Understand what I'm saying? Your government, my government, came in and resegregated America through the New Deal, through the Federal Housing Authority, through the local Chicago Housing Authority, from everywhere from Baltimore, Chicago, Atlanta, Montana, Ferguson, it, 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 it segregated and resegregated and made it to where white and black people could never touch. Now, understand one thing, and this is going to upset some people, but it is what it is. Separate but equal was never equal. Ain't never going to be equal. So as long as they can keep us over here away from white people, they're going to be able to keep us away from the services that we need. And that's what we saw happen. Now understand that it happened on a lot of fronts. Happened on public housing. Happened in zoning. Happened on home ownership. Whatever black people got credit or got the stuff that they thought they was going to need to move to the next level, white people changed the game. The government changed the game. This, this is why, black people, this is why, understand me, this is why this people of color stuff is nonsense. Because this was not weaponized against some random people of color. This was descendants of slaves. I'm not saying nobody else got caught up in it. I'm not saying you will never see a poster that says, we don't want Mexicans here either. No, but this was weaponized specifically against African Americans who were descendants of slaves. And this people of color designation whitewashes that. So if you want to do one thing, you got to get rid of it. But let's move on. Let's talk about us. Let's talk about one city in particular. That where you see People living in harmony. And then you see the government coming in and saying, you can't be around them people. You can't be around black people. You can't be around white people. And white people, you can't be around them. And we're going to talk about what happened as a consequence of segregating these two groups. You had Helena Montana. Now, understand one thing about Helena Montana. Before the government came, before we had this whole run-up, to you know, because I think the I think the South won the Civil War. I don't care what nobody. I'm not talking about what happened in America. I'm talking about in terms of the consequence for Black people. The South won because you had in Helena or Helena. Don't bother me with pronunciations right now. You had Black people living with white people quite harmoniously. You had a Black. This was like understand when this was. This was like. This was like in 1904, 1906, somewhere around there. You had a white community that was policed by a black police officer. The black people in that community, you know, in terms of the AME church, the 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 in 19 the the you had the, the black police officers you had the the church there held a conference for all the churches they had black newspapers they had black literary associations they had everything until 1906 in 1906 a prosecutor came in and said listen you white people over there need to assert yourself. You got to start asserting yourself. This was all part of how after Reconstruction, when these, when, when, when the Southern races started pushing that narrative. See, that narrative caught fire. And they started pushing that around. And the government co-signed. See, our lives would be, our lives, listen, in order to make us whole, you basically, you can't really say this about not being native black. But you have to make us white in every sense of the word. No, let me just say it again. In order for us to be okay, you have to make us white. Now, what, what does that mean? You got I, I should be, like, listen, we shouldn't be cordoned off. We're not living in black neighborhoods. See, this is this fake, this fake phony empowerment talk that we're just living in black neighborhoods because we love other black people. Yeah, we love other black people, but we're not racist. Black people ain't racist like that. We're not discriminatory like that. We love everybody. We, I mean, we'll be cool with anybody unless you just be nasty to us. We're decent people. 
So get off that. We chose to live here. We didn't choose to live nowhere. They didn't leave us no space but to move nowhere else. They cordoned us off and put us in the slums. Let's understand something. When that white prosecutor did that, everything changed. Now, if you look at hell in the now, it's a totally different place, mostly white. They banned interracial marriage there. Right? So you, you can't be mixing like that. That's what they did. Now, understand one thing. When you talk about making progress, another area where blacks were making progress, another area where we were making progress was federal jobs. During that time, we were making progress in federal jobs in a very significant way. Well, you say to me, Vet, what, what way were we making? What way were we? Thank you, Not Your Typical Nigger. I appreciate that um, in the chat. But what way were we making progress, Yvette? Can you please? Black people will really, when you look in terms of like early 1900s, in the federal government, we had, super, we had even started getting supervisory positions in the federal government. We were moving. You know what happened? Woodrow Wilson came in. Woodrow Wilson came in and said, guess what, black people? He not only segregated and made segregation law. We're not talking about one individual. We're talking about Woodrow Wilson making segregation the law in terms of the federal government. This dude even put up curtains between white workers and black workers. That's Woodrow Wilson. Even when you talk, say, so you have to go up the ladder, right? So that's the federal government. But you have to go up the ladder. You have to go up the ladder and understand what that means. We talking federal government. But understand something. Same thing happened in public housing. Same thing happened with zoning. Same thing happened with home ownership. Black people, African Americans, descendants of slaves in this country, not people of color, getting locked out of that. Okay, so what do you mean? What do you mean? If you read the color of law, we were evicted. Like you had you had situations where white and black people were living together. And we were evicted to make room for white housing. You had played pieces where black people were living somewhere and we were evicted to make room for white housing. And so they Force us to be segregated. But understand, separate is never equal. That separate but equal stuff is a bunch of baloney. Anytime they can take you and put black people by themselves, they're going to treat us worse when we over there because ain't nobody over there but us. So what that means is less services. What that means is bad schools. What that means is that you don't have access to nothing. Now, see, that this is why I bring in the do for self. The do for self is like, well, we can just do. No, 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 no. The, the stuff that you need, they knew it was going to be around white people. That's why the government separated us and tore us apart, right? And let me tell you, also had more housing for them. And then they could go, they made it, they set it up. Let me tell you how slick the government was. The government set it up to where they could go over here and get some public housing. But they could have, have, have nice services. It'd be closer to regular white people. They could become part of communities, Whereas even when the war effort was going on, they put us over here in little shabby housing. We didn't even get no real war housing. We didn't even get no real public housing when the government came in and did what they did. Understand what that meant for our lives. I'm going to get to it. I want you to understand it. You got to understand what this means in terms of population density. Black people living on top of each other because they got an excess of public housing for white people and not enough public housing for black people. And public housing didn't even mean what it means today. See, we talk about public housing in terms of the ghetto. Understand that white people, the, the, the lawmakers, the, the, the government, our government created the ghetto. Well, no, that was just affordable housing because there was not enough affordable housing for, 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 for low class and middle class people. Because what no, what no, you just put five or ten percent down. No, you gotta put some real money down and then nobody have it. And then there was a war going on during the period I'm talking about right now. So you also had housing for people who are working in that. See, one of the things that happens with us black people, we don't understand timing. And I don't know how else to say this. But timing is everything. Timing is the whole ball game. So what happened when you see white people walking around there talking about, well, my people worked hard. And they're not telling you the truth. The truth is that nothing, like, nothing matters as much as what they got that we didn't get. Nothing matters as much. 
You know, we 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 made houses because we didn't get because because we didn't get what they got in terms of their housing. We made houses out of orange crates, people. That's a shabby house because we couldn't get access to loans. We couldn't get because the government said you cannot, we will not insure anything. We were not going to give you public housing. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that for black people. So black people had to move all the way out and make their own houses. That's not wealth that you can pass down. You can't pass down no house you made with some orange crates. That's not anything that you can do. This is the U.S. Housing Authority. And here's a, in a manual, this is not, in a manual, the U.S. Housing Authority said we should not disrupt communities. And everybody knew what that meant. We should have harmonious communities. And they told people you should not want to be around these other people because they're going to bring your property value down. And, 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 and they were, well, I'm not going to get to that even just yet. That's, I mean, they wanted all of the, and this was, this was the Public Works Authority. This was all of them. And this was the Lanham Act. If you, if you don't have a book yet, go and Google the Lanham Act and how they, how they circumvented the Lanham Act, which, said, which financed houses for workers in the defense industry and took us a, listen, it took us away. The government, your government, my government, separated us from white people and took us to the ghetto and made where we live the ghetto. And even when builders said, I want to, I, I'm, I'm willing to make, Homes for these people, for black people. They said, no, we're not, we're not for, we, no, you cannot do that. The federal government would not finance that. That is your government turning against you as a group of people. That is your government. Understand that. Now, understand something else, black people. Understand that even during the war, we got what's called extension housing, which was not real housing. That's little housing they built just for garbage housing and it which means you're gonna leave white people got housing further inland which means they're gonna be a part of the community with citizens who were forced out not by any just not just by a white mob but by the acquiescence of the united states government everything could have and would have been different if our government had stood up against racists and and said no we're not going to treat these people. We have said these people are citizens and we're going to treat them like citizens because we were on the march. We were on the march towards a real people and the government, the United States government of America, the United States government of America stopped us. You know, a few AAs, you know, African Americans made it into a, you know, a, 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 if they made it into a neighborhood. Like if a few black people made it into a neighborhood, the government would designate that a black neighborhood. Now understand what that means. What that means is that white people couldn't even be good white people if they wanted to. There was a case in the book where a white man sublet his apartment to a black man. He owned it. You know, he had the FHA loan. The FHA wasn't lending to black people. Federal Housing Authority, that was a racist rule of the United States government, wasn't lending to us. But the man sublet to a black man, it was like in California, and they said, they, 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 the people around called the FBI. And what eventually happened, because they, they couldn't prove that the man bought the house to, to lease, they said, we're never going to give you a loan again. We are never going to give you a loan because you were a good white person and you were not racist. Understand what that means in terms of what we're experiencing here today. Your government has, your, our government turned against us for so many times. Understand. You go to, you go to like a factory, right? But your black dollar don't matter because your black dollar has been cut in half by the government. People, white people are getting houses and getting wealth and they're moving with that wealth and they're going to have equity in their house because they got a good house, not a shabby house to pass down to their kids. You have none of that because your government has decided that you are not worth anything. Your government has decided that you do not have any constitutional rights. You have to understand that we are living that consequence. 
And to understand that we are living that consequence, you have to understand that this is not this. You cannot undo with your individual effort something that was done to you by the government of the most powerful country in the world and done to you over years, over presidents. This was not just one thing was slavery. When you look at how this was, how it, when you, when you take a close look at this, a lot of the remedies didn't come to the 1980s and 1990s, 1970s. And then what they did, go look up like the Buchanan Act. What they did when they figured out, hey, we, we're, 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 we're doing some stuff that's against the law in terms of discriminating against black, discriminating against black people. What they said was, we're just going to stick and move. And we're just not going to say it's racist, but it's going to be racist. So you had the circumvention of actual, of, of, of the law. These people were playing games. They were playing games with us. According to the Institute and Social Policy, each uh, 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 and social for each dollar of increase in average income that African American households saw between 1984 and 2009. Hold on, let me get this. Let me get this right. In 2009, according to the Institute on Assets and Social Policy, for each dollar of increase in average income that African-American households saw between 1984 and 2009, just 69 cents in additional wealth was generated, compared with the same dollar in increased income creating an additional $5 in wealth for a similarly situated white household. We did everything right. Our government did everything wrong. That's why we don't. That's why we didn't get that dollar. So anybody who is telling you, Yvette, we can do something to move this. This is something that can be fixed with our individual individual effort. Is ignorant. Understand that that person does not understand America. They do not understand race in America. They do not understand history. And you need to get away from that person. See, people who call me, oh, these Negro naysayers. No, I just understand America. And I just understand what it means to be native black. I don't want to call myself African American no more. I'm finished with that. I, I don't. I understand what it means to be native black, descendant of slave in this country. I understand blackness in America. You don't understand that because you don't read. You don't. You you live in this dream world. Understand that there are no economists in the height of inequality that agree with this do for do for self nonsense. Everybody knows what was done to us. And you know who laughs when you do this stupid stuff? People like Rush Limbaugh. I, you know, racists love when you do this stupid stuff. When you go around saying you can do it. Because that means they ain't never even got to listen to you talk about fixing it. That means they know you don't understand America. They know you don't understand history. They love it. They love throwing out black business as a fix to you. They understand that. You don't understand anything. 1949 Housing Act. Tell me about that, do for selfers. Oh, you don't know anything about that. You know, what this did, though, from public housing to redlining, all of this stuff, it moved us. See, people will say, well, it moved us out of the mainstream. No, nah, that's not really what happened. What happened is it locked us out. See, because in order to be American, what you need is what was happening during that war. What you really need to be American is what the, see, in that window, America, there was also this whole communism thing going on. So one of the things that America tried to do to combat communism was say, we're going to get people invested in America by having them buy houses. You're not going to have that today. That's over. You needed to get it then. Because that's when America was giving it away. America was like the ball in the strip club. Just who wanted? it? And that's when you got it. You can't come back as a 50-year-old as a stripper in the same club and look for what them, what them ballers that was here 30 years ago. Where y'all at? No. That's not how it works. That window what Americans were becoming American is over and the reason that we didn't get any of it 
is because America as a country, not as racist individuals, not as the Klan only, but America as a country said no. They said we're gonna have, we're gonna put our racist manuals. We're gonna give FHA loans, FHA insurance loans, bank loans, which are guaranteed loans, which everybody wanted, to, which everybody wanted. Builders love those FHA loans because they was guaranteed. And they said, but you can't give none to black people. And it didn't even matter if we were middle class. They said, we don't care if these are middle class black people. We're not giving no loans to them. We're not giving no FHA back loans to these people. I don't care how good they are. I don't care how good their credit is. That's why you can't be like, well, I'm going to fix my credit. They're going to change the game. It didn't matter how good their credit was. We're not giving it to you. We don't care. You can't live here. Go build yourself a house with an orange crate. That's what your government did. And you are a moron if you think you are going to fix that with no basis in fact, with no basis in ec economics, with nothing. You think you're going to fix that, what the government did over hundreds of years. If you think you're going to fix that with individual effort, you are delusional and living in your own dream world. And there's nothing I can do to help you. There is absolutely nothing that I can do to help you. I don't even know why you're here. You might as well go watch Superman or Black Panther or somebody. We'll be talking about that too. But you might as well go watch something else because I can't help you. Because you obviously have some psychological problems that need to be attended to. Now listen. What happened with public housing is they actually changed the economic threshold. And eventually what they said is that public housing is only for the poorest of the poor, which included who? Black people. Poorest of the poor. What that also meant, though, is the people who were maintaining public housing left because they didn't have the, they didn't have the income. They, they, they exceed the income threshold. This is also true for housing that black people built themselves because when you talk about wealth, there was no equity in the house that you built with crates. But the, the, the other thing is... The, the house, like when you look at the, what they left, there, there's no money in that house. There's nothing to pass down in that house. So when you look at it, when you, when, you, when you talk about inheritance, that's why we don't have it. It's not because we need to buy less joy and do whatever. We don't have it because the government told us, no, you can't have it. We did everything right. And the government said, just because you're black, we're going to say this community is risky. And we're not going to give any FHA back loans. That's what the government said. And that's what, that's what they did. They didn't just say it. They did it. This is, this is the United States government we're talking about. They didn't just say it. They, they don't just have to say it. They put it in law. They put it in their manuals. They hired real estate agents to make sure. And go out and inspect homes and make sure we didn't get any part of that government money. That we didn't get access to those white communities. See, we could have been, we could have been all Americans in this thing right now. With, 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 with all of that and everything that meant. But they, they took that away. They put us over here and it wasn't enough housing over here. And then black people want to say, oh my God, we just need to take better care of our homes. And, and we just need to... Farrakhan said that one time, well, you know, in a magazine, well, we, we, I will take care of my yard. Listen, this is what happened to us. You have to understand what happened to us. And if you don't understand what happened to us, you just shouldn't talk. What happened to us is that we got homes that were not insured, which means that they cost more money. When you get a home, see this, what the FHA, what the FHA did in terms of the homes, in terms of mortization, go look that up. In terms of FDR, all of that stuff, and this is something that Obama could have done as well. They, they, they redid these mortgages after the Depression, right? And they, they gave mortgages that were good for people, and you, you had to pay less money. It was, a, it was a good deal, but we couldn't have access to it. So they got these houses that had money and had equity, and they got them on the cheap. And we had to build houses. We got raggedy houses, houses that were less. And even when builders built the houses, they had to build them cheaper because they weren't backed by the government. And so we got less in terms of equity. We got less in terms of wealth. We got houses. And then because we were paying so much for our houses, because we were paying so much for our houses, we didn't have enough for upkeep. So when you look at our houses and say, look at these people, they ain't even keeping their house up. They didn't have enough to keep it up. 
They didn't get no FHA back loan. FHA said these are red. When you talk about red line, they said these communities, these are red. These communities are green. And what made them red and green? Nothing but one was black and one was white. Or one had too many black people. So what you did is, even white people who weren't racist, you incentivized them to be racist. Because what you said too was, if y'all build a structure that ensures that ain't no black people coming, then we'll, we'll hook you up. Just build a structure around your community. A pond, a river, a lake. Build some kind of buffer zone that ensures that ain't no black people coming over here. And we will make sure that you get all the FHA loans you need. So communities that separated themselves from us were incentivized. You have to understand that. You, there's no way to understand what this means without understanding that. You know... We, we, we all know about Brown versus Board, but one of the things that we don't know is about Shelley versus Kramer was supposed to do the same thing with housing. In 1911, racial covenant were added to a set of St. Louis homes now not allowing sales to black. Thurgood Marshall made arguments. The court ruled with the blacks, but the force of the ruling wasn't felt until the 1970s. So what we really had, what we really had, ladies and gentlemen, Let's talk very clearly about what we had. We had, what good is a law? What good is a law if there's nothing backing it up? I'm going to ask the chat and I'm going to look at the chat. Tell me, just, just tell me, what good is a law if it have no teeth? What you find with, with what you find with in terms of anti discrimination law? Everybody talk about going to the courts and doing this and doing that. What you find in terms of anti discrimination law is that it had no teeth. So what do you do? Let me know. Can y'all still see me? What you, what do you do with a law that has no teeth? It's a law, but it don't matter. People just circumvent it at will. What does that mean? Can somebody tell me? I'm just trying to figure out what that means because the law is supposed to mean something. Like, to be a citizen, to be a citizen, the whole thing is you're supposed to have constitutional rights. The Constitution is supposed to mean something for you. That's part of what being a citizen means. The Constitution has a meaning for you and your life. But what does it mean? What does it mean when the Constitution that is supposed to protect your rights does not mean anything for you as an African American citizen? That's what we went through. And you're going to tell me you do for selfers. You're going to tell me that you're going to fix. And you're going to let the government off the hook. You talk like you're so tough. But you're going to let the government off the hook. For locking you out. When it when everybody else was getting wealth and getting equity. And we were doing stuff. We were building stuff. And, and, and the government was saying no. This wasn't just some random white race who was saying. The government was saying absolutely not. We're not doing that. And you're going to tell me. Well I as an individual event. Am going to circumvent what, 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 what happened. I am going to circumvent what happened with my individual effort. That makes you a crazy person. There's no other way for me to say it. Because understand, understand something. We've always talked, we've all, we, we just talked about public housing. Let's talk about zoning. Do you all mind if we take a moment to talk about zoning in the chat? Do you all mind? Can we talk about, can we talk about zoning for one moment? Because... Understand that most of that I had a little bit of that conversation about how about housing, but most of what I just said was about public housing. It wasn't about it, most of it was not about home ownership, right? And most of it was not about living in an apartment. And 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 we are living in a time. This is how timing matters. Understand this. We are living in a time. And people say, well, we can do it all the same. We are living in a time where we have an influx of immigrants. We are living in a time 
of the highest income inequality that the globe has ever known. That's the time that we're living in. You cannot go and make right what they should have made right through all of those presidents. You cannot do that during the period that we're now living in. That's not possible. And you ain't Superman. You're not Superman and you ain't no other Marvel character. The only thing you're doing is getting yourself closer to a stroke because you don't understand what it means to be black in America. Now understand one thing. When we talk about zoning, and I want to talk about how do for self was I, I mean, I honestly sometimes think do for self was hate black people. And 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 the reason uh, thank you, my guy. The, the the reason I say that is is very simple. If if you understood through all these presidents how the government weaponized policy, regulation, put out manuals for how you can, the black people are basically to have nothing from this government. If you understood that, then you would understand what this government owes us and what we have to fight for. If you do not under so I don't understand if you understand that and I don't think you do but if you understand that then you understand that this is not our fault but see black blaming black people see this thing would do for self was they just like wrestling boy and Sean Hannity is go around blaming black people for everything that's the easy thing to do you coward you punk you just go around blaming black people for everything. Well, see, I know, I know how black people and black people, everything. Listen, let me show you one of the things that you can do. If, if you talk to somebody, if you have a car, or you listen to somebody, and everything they do is talking about what's wrong with black people, move along. Move along. Because understand with zoning, see, where they couldn't push us out, they zoned us out. So they public housing, they pushed us out. And where they couldn't push us out, they zoned us out. So when you had black neighborhoods, they wouldn't let us go. We were barred from going to the suburbs and getting homes because the because the, the, the government sided with racist city councils and all of that. So we were barred from going there and getting homes. So what happened after we were barred was that we were zoned out. What does being zoned out mean, Event? Well, they created zoning laws and, and different things to, to make sure that we didn't have access to what they had going on. So what are you saying, Event zoning? They zoned us out of their communities. And not only that. They zoned our communities for liquor stores. They zoned our communities for brothels. We had a lot of prostitution. They zoned our communities for incinerators. They zoned our community for things that were environmentally racist. So people, so I kind of get a chuckle sometimes when I hear white people talk about, well, don't you care about the polar bear? I and the polar bear and you never cared about the polar bear when it was black people we over here choking and coughing and being poisoned and you never cared you never cared we've been we, li, listen let me put this up let me put this up for you real real quick because we got to just show i put this in one of the newsletters the newsletter is two dollars a month and i send it out but look at this this if you get a chance to go and read this i'm gonna put this up right now Exxon Mobil is still pumping toxins into black community in Texas 17 years after civil rights complaints. 17 years. Understand what that means. I need you to understand what that means. That is not just some case of some random case of en environmental toxin. That's what that's what they did to us. They said, listen, all you environmentalists, y'all been living off of this. Y'all been living in good neighborhoods because all the garbage was put in black neighborhoods and you didn't say nothing. So don't come in here now and say, Yvette, don't you care about the polar bear? I am the polar bear. Black people have been the polar bear for a long time and y'all didn't come and try to rescue the polar bear in. So go rescue the polar bear on your own. I think black people probably understand more than anybody what it's like to be that polar bear. I really do. Because we have lived through this whole thing. Now listen. Understand one thing. When you see what you see. Why in the world would an immigrant want to come to this country and have us remember color of law? Like why would they want to remember what happened to African Americans? They don't have a dog in that fight. 
They don't, they, don't, they don't have a dog in our justice claim. So it's such a scheme and a scam to just come here. We'll just call everybody people of color and we'll just all be the same. We'll just, we'll just kind of erase what it means to be African American in this country because we're all brown. And African Americans, not knowing our history, said, you know what, you got a point. We is all in this together. Ain't we? Yeah, we sure live. You got to be crazy. These new immigrants have experienced nothing like what we have seen in our history in terms of the, the government weaponizing American policy, housing policy, and every other policy against us. They have seen nothing like that. They have benefited. They have benefited from the things that we did fight for and the things that we eventually got. But we bear the entire cost. And so nobody is asking the question of the United States government, what do we get for bearing this cost? Because I don't want to just be equal to some new, to some new immigrant. I'm sorry if you're offended. I don't really care. I need an advantage. I don't want equality. Equality is garbage. Given what we contributed to this country and how long we were shut out, we need more than equality. And I'm not going to listen to anybody that tells me I got to work 18 hours a day and just hustle harder because I don't want to beg the white man. It's not begging the white man. This is your government. The government did this. So if somebody, if somebody punches you for 30 years and you are bruised and fractured, you say, I, I'm not going to blame him. I'm just going to fix myself. People would say, oh, you're crazy. And that's just, that's not even, that's not even analogous to what we're talking about. But even in that small situation, people say, oh, you got, you, you got a problem. But nobody wants to tell these do for selfers, you got a problem. You got a problem. You got a problem. I think, I honestly think some of you do for selfers are mentally ill. And I, and I understand why. You know, Pelosi stood up today for eight hours talking about DACA. DACA, 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 DACA. When last time you hear Nancy Pelosi standing up for African Americans who have been, who have been put in, in, who are citizens in this country, you are standing up for non-citizens in a way you have never stood up for African Americans. And you want us to come, but you, but you tell us every year we should vote Democrat, right? You have never stood up for us in any kind of way that matters. You better leave me alone. And we see the consequence. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living the consequence of all of this. You know, let me let me see if I can let me see if I can find this is a when we talk about environmental racism, you know, I, I want to get another clip if I have it. That's one, but that's not the one I'm looking for. I want to get another clip if I have it because, you know, this is another one. I want you to, you all take a look at this. A massive chemical plant is poised to wipe this Louisiana town off the map. Off the map. Off the map. Now, who was it found by? Is a 224 year old community founded by freed slaves. Freed slaves. This is how we're treated in this country as full citizens. This is our life in this country. To be poisoned while our legislators do the bidding of non citizens. That is our life in this country. What does that mean to you? I told somebody earlier, I said, listen. I said, one of the things that I, you know, I have never wanted to be a Congress person. I, I, I don't have, I don't have a lot of desire for anything, but I said, listen. One of the things that I wanted to be, today, today is the only day I think I wanted, I put it on Facebook. I think I wanted to be a Congress person because I wanted to walk up to her and be like, I hope you pass out. Right now, with your old self. I hope your ill, I hope you hit the floor. Bam! And I'm not going to say anything. Because you don't care about us. You just use us for votes. You have nothing for us. And we don't demand anything. We have John Lewis. Who stands up about gun laws and everything. But we still drinking lead water. Everything that we're living is the consequence of what this country has done. Not just slavery. It comes from slavery, but... Every law, every manual locked us out of what it means to be American. Then you want to invite these other people in and tell them they can be American and you never made me American. 
Screw you. I'm finished. And let me just say this. One of the things that I said before, and I know I'm going to upset some people, but that's just life. And this doesn't mean that I think this person is an awful person, but I think what we have to do as human beings, this is, and this is part of being grown. Like if you're going to have an emotional reaction to everything, understand that you ain't grown. And we don't need to have a conversation because I'm grown. One of the things that we have to do is look back with a critical eye and say, how could I have done this better? Or was this a good thing? Sometimes you may think something's good and you look back and it ain't good. I have been very honest in terms of my evolution. Like some things, I, I used to think immigration in my 20s was a great thing. And we all got to stick together until I looked at the data and I looked at our history. So, one of the things that I have to, I understand. And, and you know, it is what it is. And I, did, and, and I can't blame anybody else because there was a time that I didn't necessarily understand it. There was a time where I said, well, what, 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 what are they talking about? I don't, I'm not fully clear of what it means and all that stuff. Well, you have this whole culture that has come out of the, the, the Chappelle show about this crack addict, right? And he was a crackhead, and he was pulling on the ground. And I think Antonio mentioned it. And the reason I bring it up because everybody got mad. Oh, Antonio hates Chappelle. Yvette hates Chappelle. They hate no Chappelle. Monique hates no Chappelle. But listen, I'm bringing everybody out. This is just me. Take everybody else out of this conversation. This is me. What I'm saying is this. I'm not saying anything about anybody. I'm just saying ask yourself a question. When you look back at this character now, because this character got legs because Chappelle been gone for a long time before he came back. The Chappelle show been gone for a long time and we still use this character to create memes. I want you to ask yourself. Don't ask anybody else. I don't you don't have to answer this question. But ask your you don't have to answer it publicly, but ask yourself, was it good? You know, you, when we look at what happened, the government created the slums. The government created the ghetto. We don't want to call it the ghetto no more, like, like, like Rothstein said. We want to call it the inner city. No, it's the ghetto. The government created the ghetto and the slum. And the slum created these crackheads because these alcoholics and crackheads, they put alcohol in our community. We already know the CIA and what happened with drugs in our community. They put this in our community and in, our, in, in kind of like a comedic response. We laughed at it in a way that I just don't understand whether or not that was good for us. Now, 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 you can now understand when I talked about Monique and Chappelle the other day, people like, Oh, you better trying to say Monique's better than Chappelle. I'm not saying that, I'm just saying that they're different. Different is not better or worse. What I'm saying is that Chappelle is a guy with white friends, he had a white, you know, a best friend who helped him with the Chappelle show. I'm just asking you. In terms of where that came from, who was supposed to laugh at this crackhead? Who, who, who was supposed to laugh at this crackhead? That's what I'm asking you. And I'm asking you, was it a good thing? If it was white people, was it a good thing to give white people permission to laugh at the thing that the United States government created? Because the government created this crackhead. They created the slum that created the crackhead. So what I'm asking you, and I want you to do this without any emotion. I want you to do this without being mad at me or even mad at Chappelle right now. I want you to think about this. Think about it clearly. Because we have to be, we have to be precise in terms of how we do things. We African American. I said I, I said I was going to say that. I, no. We're native blacks, descendants of slaves. Let's be clear. Is it good to laugh at the? Because when I laugh at somebody, something happens to me. When I laugh at you, I have a hard time seeing you for what you are. I have a hard time seeing the pain behind who you are. We're on a stage now where we have, we have crackhead costumes. Right? We have, these, we have these Chappelle, what was it, Tyrone Bigham's, what was it? I didn't watch the show. Tyrone Bigham's costumes. Is that a positive thing? Because this is what that legislation created. It created these people who were addicted to everything. And that addiction, if you look up, like, I don't know how many of you have looked. I can't remember his name right now. 
Um, but he's an addiction expert. And he talks about the trauma that creates addiction. And so when we look at that person now, when you see this person who's addicted to you and you walk past him, do you see him and his pain? Or do you see Chappelle? Was it good for us to laugh at the consequence of what the government had done to us? I'm asking you that from a very sincere place. I'm not saying this to get on anybody. I'm asking you this from a very heartfelt place. Is it a positive thing for us to do? Or should we see the pain that, that the government in, 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 in league with races created? Because that's all, that's all addiction is. It's just numbing. It's just a numbing agent. That's all it is. It just numbs you in a way that, you know, where you can deal with the world. So I think for me, that's the question. So, I, I, I mean, there, there are other questions from the show. And we can ask all of those questions. I'm just trying to understand. You know, there's a, there's a difference. I just want to say, there's a difference between me laughing at myself or Richard Pryor in terms of how he was raised and he did, he, he freebased and all that stuff. There's a difference between laughing to keep from crying and laughing at black people and giving other people permission to laugh at black people. You see a lot of young people, young white people coming of age, young Mex Mexicans all coming of age right now and they're using the N word and you say, well, why is that? What do you ever think that like they grew up during this era where we had the N-I-G-G-A-R family and we had the crackhead? Like we have to start thinking about the consequences of our actions. And it doesn't mean you, 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 you just have to, you just, ha you, and you have to have it without becoming emotional and saying Yvette's a hater and she's a naysayer. You know, you, you have to understand that Liquor and all the trash and all the toxins were thrown into our neighborhoods. And you have to understand the consequence of, of it's, it's not just about housing. It's about the consequence. I mean, you had a family. If you read Color of Law, there was a, there was a family. And it's not just about rich people. Because there was, a, there was a family in there who a rich baron of industry took this black guy in who was a railroad magnet and the black guy brought his family in and they did all this stuff and, and, and the government still wouldn't allow, give them a FHA back loan to move into a community. that's now a very nice community with good equity and good housing and all of that. They wouldn't let us be American, but Nancy Pelosi wants these people, these DACA people to be American. And they, we went hundreds of years, hundreds of years and we're still not American. Understand what that means. Understand, I, I don't know how else to say it, but understand exactly what that means. You know, you had people, we had people say, well, what about, you know, you're talking about, you're talking about, you're talking about people who live in the ghetto and you're talking about public housing and you're talking about zoning. No, 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 no. When, when, when black people who are middle class and making good money, decent enough money. Decent enough jobs came through and said, I want to I wanna live in the neighborhood. They, they decided they were going to have deed restrictions. A deed restriction prohibited is what prohibited blacks in terms of home ownership. So it doesn't matter what game you were playing. It doesn't matter how good your credit was. It doesn't matter how good your, 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 your stuff, your, your, any of that was. They had decided that you were, the government had decided. Not just these, the, the government was complicit with these races and decided that you would not be included, that we would not be included. And what we're living in terms of not having, not having uh, equity in these houses, what we're living in terms of having these shabby houses, what we're living is the consequence of all of that. And anybody who tells you, well, if black people would only, cryptocurrency ain't going to solve this. Bitcoin ain't going to solve this. Ain't none of this stuff that you've been rambling about for the past weeks and months and years going to solve this. Getting your credit right ain't going to solve this. This is something that, this is, this is what it means to be American. And there was a time which America locked a group of people in and said, you are American. And what they did was say, no, 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 no. Not you people who come from slaves. We said them, not you. And they said they didn't want mixed communities. But they, didn't, they forgot that they had mixed up all of us anyway by making us, you know, because we come from slaves. 
Black women never, black women slaves never had any control over our body. You know, people bought these homes for twenty five thousand. And and these think about what these homes are worth today. We're talking like six hundred thousand. That's what they bought these homes for. Like you buy a twenty five thousand dollar house, it's worth six hundred thousand a day. And you think about what that would mean for your life. You think about what you could do with that equity. And you think about this is just housing. Imagine if 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 America had done this in every area. They didn't. They shut us out. And ain't no amount. Ain't no amount. Of do for self nonsense gonna change this for you. You can't get that back. Like I don't think we understand that you can't get it back. And let me just say something. One of the things I want to say before I end this, because I'm finna, I'm finna take the break in a second, and 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 we'll move on. But I don't. There's a lot that 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 we don't that that we understand. I mean, I, I wrote down Ferguson, Atlanta, Baltimore, Louisville. It happened everywhere. There was no place that it did that. It happened everywhere. This is our life. This is the consequence. Destroy. Let, let me just say this: destroying, destroying, destroying. And when I say black people, I mean native black descendants of slaves. Destroying black people was a federal project. Destroying black people was a federal project. That's just what it was. Now, if you want to, let's say, when you say that, that's not going to stop me. I'm still going to go to Harvard. I'm still going to go to UCLA. I'm still going to go to Princeton. I'm still going to go to Yale. No, you know what you need to access Yale? You need that house. That's your tuition. See, if you had gotten that house, you could tap into that six hundred thousand dollars that grandmama or granddaddy or whoever. Because and then a lot of them use that to buy other houses and build and build and build and build companies, but all kind of things. You needed that house to be the beginning of your wealth to tap into that. You don't have it, and they made you not American. You're not gonna fix that by taking anybody's class. It's not gonna happen. I don't care what anybody's told you. You needed that house to tap into what it means to be American. You needed what happened to those white people in terms of the Great Depression, in terms of everything that happened after the Great Depression, World War One, World War Two. They were giving, giving, giving all these houses away for a little nothing, backing all these mortgages. You needed that house because your great great grandmama, grandmama needed that house. Because getting that house is what was going to pay you and give you to give you the inheritance to move forward and go to these schools and and give you seed money. That's what they using. How you gonna compete with that now? How you think you gonna compete with that now? I don't understand. I really, you know, one of the things that I really just don't understand is how. How we think we're going to compete with that. That's what you need to access it. That would have been the money your mama or daddy or great could use to they could have gotten themselves something. That's what it was. That's the power. That's what it would have meant. You can't come back later after the game is over. Say, so now I want to play. Everybody done played the game one, counting their money. I want to play. I got a cryptocurrency thing I want to do. I want to play. My, I finally got my credit together. I want to play. It's not how the game works. And if you don't understand that, you don't know how the game works. They made that. Let me tell you how. Let me tell you how. Let me tell you how awful this is. They set up like row houses. Because we didn't have nowhere else to go, and they, the way they set it up, and then they said, "Well, you, we, we're not gonna finance anything near a row house." You, you, you don't understand who these people are. And let me, before I go to commercial break, let me, let me, for let me end with one thing. If we want to take any responsibility, this is the responsibility we need to take. <laughs> I want to ask you a question, and I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking dead in the chat. I'm looking dead in the chat right now. If a genie, a genie came down to you tonight, after
after the show ended, you chilling with your libation, you got your feet kicked up, and a genie came down to you and said, what can I give you? I'll give you anything, any place, any time. I can do everything. I can do absolutely everything because I'm a genie. So I'm going to give you whatever you want. Your wish is my command. What do you want? What would you what would you what would you want? I'm just asking, I'm looking in the chat right now. I'm just I'm just trying to figure out what would you want? If the genie came down and said, I'm gonna give you whatever you want, what you want? What do you want? What means the most to you? I'm going to give you your heart's desire. I'm not just going, I'm not going to just give you no, I'm going to give you your heart's desire. I'm the genie. I'm going to give you your heart's desire. What do you want? Now, here's the thing. Here is the thing. Here is the rub. If you answered this question and you wanted something just for your individual self, a million dollars, a bitly, or whatever, you are part of the problem. Without a doubt. You are a part of the problem. You are a part of the problem because this is not about just you. You know how I will answer that question? I will say, listen, I need you to, since you're a genie, take your genie self back in time and all this stuff that was done wrong to us, make that right. I want a community because I'm nothing without my community. I want a community that's not only stable, I want a community that has an edge. That's what I want. Go back and you do that. You fix all that stuff, genie. Go back, genie, and fix it. That's what I want. Now you take your little genie ass somewhere and fix it. That's what I want. That's my answer. What is your answer? See, a lot of y'all running around, y'all done did subprime loans talking about that's just part of doing business. You know, Yvette, you part of the problem. You don't even, see, we've gotten up to a place in the African-American community that we don't even recognize what it means to be a bad person. A lot of y'all is bad people, but you want to act like you ain't bad people. See, listen, white immigrants that came here 200 years after us, after our families, they washed themselves clean of this otherness of being immigrants and became normal Americans and take and take, you know, and, and, and that's what they are. And they can take in hustling black people, immigrants who ain't even white can do it. They were supposed to be the outsiders, but instead, all these years later, we still the outsiders. And we still don't get it. I'm going to take a quick break. And then um, then we're going to take a couple calls, ladies and gentlemen.
going on, Breaking Brown family? Oh, hold on. Let me change that. Uh, okay, I think I got the... Oh, this thing, I swear, I got too many computers in front of me. Um, Let me go to the first call. Let me go to the first call. I think I'm going to go to uh, 310. 310, tell me what's your name. Tell me where you are calling from. Hey, what's the deal, man? This is Marcus from Eaglewood. What's going on, Marcus? Not much, not much. Uh, you know, nothing really I have to say about the first part with the color of I think you nailed everything. You're on fire tonight, basically, with that Thank information. You. I just wanted to touch on a couple points real quick. Cause okay. I was a part of the whole, I guess you could say, discussion when it came to Tyrone and Dave Chappelle. Mm -hmm. you know, me and Antonio had a, a pretty pretty long back and forth. And okay. So, I would just have to say, I grew, I grew up in Inglewood, you know, I grew up around, you know, gangs, I grew up around drugs and all that type of stuff, and uh -huh. even in seeing that show, even in seeing that character, it never took away, you know, my love for people, it never took away, you know, my heartbreak for people, you know, I had drug, add drug addicts in my family, you know, my dad suffered uh, from those kind of issues, so mm -hmm. it didn't separate how I felt about the people, you mm -hmm. know, I laughed at it. When I was younger, I even chuckle at it a little bit now, I'll be honest about it. Mm -hmm. But it never separated how I felt about the people. And then the second point I want to hit mm -hmm. is you touched on, is that a proponent to the ease of people dropping in bombs? And I just have to say from my experience, you know, growing, going to school up until eighth grade, I went to school with all black people. And then in high school, it was blacks and Mexicans. Uh -huh. Mexicans dropped in bombs like it was nothing. And this was from like 96 to 2000. This was uh -huh. long before... Chappelle show, and then in college, you know, when I first got around white people, they would even try and slip it in then, so I think in terms of that, in terms of the effect of society, in terms of viewing black people, in terms of the, the stereotypes, I think we're putting a little bit too much on it. You know, I, I respect your opinion, I respect your stance, you know, I just have, I just disagree in that manner, but, you know, like I always said, 99% of the time, we're on the same page. I know, I appreciate, I appreciate you calling. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for getting that. Ooh, the trolls be for real. Ooh. Um, thank you, Carla. I do appreciate it. I do appreciate it. I'm doing things a little bit different here today, but I do appreciate your call. I think I think the thing is, and I appreciate the call, but I think one of the things we have to accept is that everybody is not us, right? And, you know, even though you have anchored yourself in blackness in such a way that you have inoculated yourself, from that sort of thing, you know, is that something that you want to promote in terms of what you're trying to do? You know, I, 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 I don't think, see, this is the thing. This is the thing with, with me and the caller. I, I, I can't chuckle at it. Like, I can't chuckle at, I can't, I cannot chuckle you know, it took me years to kind of understand why I wasn't a Chappelle Show fan. I can't chuckle at that. I can't chuckle at, like, this, this, this person who's addicted to crack. When I know what, when I know what gave rise to that, I can't do it. I, I just can't do it. It's not funny to me. I understand why it would be funny to some people. I understand why it would be funny to, to, to racists. I don't get to chuckle at, like, a man... Who is defecating on the road and then say I want to do politics? I don't get I don't get the chuckle at a man who's you know who's got ashy face and everything because he ain't bathed because he's an addict and then say Yvette you know you know my my sister's on crack can you help me out? You don't get to do both of these things. So my thing is if you want to chuckle, then you need to go your own way because you need to understand that's not. That's not what we're about. We can't be about we can't be about black politics and the consequence of black politics being laugh at what white people have done to black people. Like I can't laugh at it. And I think regardless of whether or not you're a Chappelle show fan, you could be a Chappelle, you could be a Chappelle fan and still look back and say, you know what? Given time I look back and that shit ain't cool no more. And I'm not doing it no more. That's just the way life works. So I'm going to the next call. I'm going to 623-623. What's your name? Where you calling from? <coughs> 623? Hi, Beth. This is Kiana. Hi, What's going on, family. Kiana? Hi. I'm a subscriber. Subscribe, everyone. Donate. Thank you. you. I agree with you 100%. You're welcome. I agree with you 100% all the time. 
Native black descendants of slaves, absolutely. That's what we need to be claiming. And that's what we are. I agree. We need the government to fix what they have done to push us out and lock us out, mm -hmm. locking out the descendants of uh, slaves. You know, we need that to be fixed with our reparations. That's the only way we're going to be able to fix this is, for, is to hold the government accountable for that. Yeah, no, I agree. And All I mean, this do for self, that's just, you know, selling people dreams, and, and that's not going to work. And the thing is, not only is it not going to work, understand something. Like, people don't understand. Anything that is not that is just basically a dodge. Like, like. There was a there was a great article about um, Atlanta, and I'm gonna put this up right now. It was about how you know uh, people in Atlanta are still living the the consequence of, of 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 being you know descendants of slaves in this country, in terms of home ownership, home ownership, in terms of what and I you know this is where I grew up in in terms of what black homes are worth in South Dakota and what white homes are worth. That's all the consequence of the same stuff. That's all the consequence of the same thing. So when I see people say what I hear them say a lot, and thank you, Carl, I appreciate you. I'm going to let you go so I can get some other calls in. When I, hear, when I hear people say what I hear people say a lot, well, we can do it. What I hear you basically saying is dodging. You're basically giving me a dodge. You're not giving me a solution. You're not giving me an answer. You're trying to dodge because you don't want to face this United States government because Uncle Sam got some stuff for you. You're not big enough to, 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 to go up against Uncle Sam. You're not big enough to, to join me in that fight. So when you say I'm a naysayer and I just don't believe now, I'm willing to go up against the biggest bully on the field and that's our own government you don't want to do that you just want to sit around and blame other black people that makes you a coward and it makes you a coward who doesn't understand history let me put up a little a little chart that goes with this i mean I, as, as i'm gonna take the next caller but as i do that i want you all to take a to take a look at this chart and just 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 sort of begin to digest you know what this chart what this chart means for i could for this is this is still the same county, same everything, but just, and it was in the Atlanta Journal Constitution. But just, just begin to digest what this means for us, our life, and our predicament. Um, 202, I'm coming to you now. 202, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, 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 how y'all doing? What's up, Alexander? We got you two times? Oh, my God. <laughs> I almost missed you today. I was doing some work, and I remembered, uh, Remember you were always there. You hitting them from so many ang different angles tonight. But Got you. Let me say something first about it. Dave Chappelle. Then I'm gonna get to the okay. the bigger topic. Actually, event what people should know is Dave Chappelle stopped his show because of what you the very nature of what you said. Mm. He 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 actually I remember watching the interview. He. He essentially said, I looked up one day and some people were laughing. You know how white men have that long, that long white man laugh. <laughs> 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 they were laughing, that long white man laughing the joke. And suddenly he realized they were not laughing with him. They were laughing at him. Mm. And he talked about, you know, it was at that moment that he began to grapple mm -hmm. with exactly you know, the nature, the impact of his jokes. So I think Dave Chappelle uh, actually would agree with you to a certain extent. I'm not sure, you know, how much that would stop his joking, but I think that, you know, a lot of what you're saying, uh, he actually began to grapple with the responsibility of a black comic, and I think that's what ultimately led him from walking away from the show. But I, w I want to get to this, this bigger thing, um, mm -hmm. because I think people, Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. You can hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you fine. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. But uh, people don't realize the depths of our justice claim uh, against what has happened to us. So consider the fact that we were not stole, we were sold. Ooh! And we were sold by... By who, Alexander? by tribal fathers in Benin, Ghana, and Nigeria, and in Africa. Uh, oh. This is very important to understand. So we were sold by Africans 
uh, at the top of the food chain, if you look at the GDP of African nations today, you will find that the ones at the top are the ones who were complicit in the transatlantic slave trade. So that's first of all. So once we got to America, then you had uh, the Native Americans uh, owned That's true. black slaves. Yeah. Uh, you know, the five civilized tribes, the Choctaw, the Creek, the Seminole, the Muscogee, the Cherokee, uh, they all owned black slaves, which is the big lawsuit that just happened where the descendants of those slaves that were owned by Native Americans uh, just won a big decision uh, that they should be rendered as uh, uh, Cherokee citizens of the Cherokee Nation. Mm. Uh, then you have, uh, think about the first uh, black filmmaker. Uh, Ooh, the first yeah. black filmmaker, what is the brother's name? Um, uh, Oscar, uh, Oscar Devereaux. Oscar Devereaux, uh, his family were descendants of slaves that were owned by the French Huguenot refugees. You know, so think about this now. So this means that black people are beneath Africans, uh, beneath immigrants. Uh, you know, we're beneath refugees. We're beneath all of these people. And we now stand uh, in America uh, rendered as classless, stateless, um, at the bottom in every statistical category. And we really don't understand how how bad this actually is. I, I mean, I mean it's, it's really, it's almost like you can't even capsulate uh, a lot uh, of what you're saying. And the problem is, we don't even have, we, we, we have representatives, but we don't have representation. Does that make any sense? We have representatives, and we don't have representation. Right. We don't have representation. So we don't have people that are actually fighting on our behalf. Because most of the people, they don't even understand these issues. I mean, hell, I have a friend who worked for John Lewis who said, the reason why I stopped working for John Lewis is because every time he got on uh, the floor of the Capitol of the, uh, uh, of the House of Representatives, no matter whether it was domestic policy, foreign policy, climate change, uh, military policy, no matter what it was, it all came down to from when he marched from Selma to Montgomery. Now think of the consequence of that. Think of the consequence of that if the if the, if your worldview is the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I mean, think about that. Mm. And so we love it as black people as symbols, but does that really get us? Um, Absolutely uh, not. Absolutely uh, not. It, yeah, does it? Does it get us really any close to that? And this drug thing, that, that, that is so powerful. Because you're asking us to be conscious of what we laugh at. Now, yes. this is very important because we're living in a time where the federal government is about to allocate billions of dollars to the opioid crisis. I got into a huge debate with a white lawyer recently uh, who was talking about how we need to really solve the heroin uh, and, and the opioid crisis with, with, that's going on in rural white America. And he asked me what I think. I said, well, I believe in absolute racial equality. And absolute racial equality means that we should handle the opioid crisis exactly how we handle the war on drugs. Absolutely. Lock them all up. We should throw them away. We should throw away the key. We should give mass incarceration. And then that would be equal. And then Absolutely. everybody in the room looks at me like I'm crazy. But, but it's the truth. And so you, you, you realize that when you you're laughing at these things, and it's hard because I'm laughing at. I've been guilty. We've all been you're guilty. Asking us to be, we've all been guilty. You're asking us to be conscious of what we laugh at. You're, you're, being, you're asking us to. You're asking us to never. You're asking us to never go to sleep. To, yeah, to you gotta go say, but, and we can't afford to go to sleep. What I'm telling you is that you can't afford to go to sleep because if you go to sleep, like what I feel like, and what I, what I, the data that I see, Alexander, tells me that like we're in a coffin. And they're, they're, they're putting nails in. If you go to sleep in a coffin where they're tapping nails in and you go to sleep, you know what happens? You you wake up you wake up in that coffin and you can't get out because you're six feet under. You got to kick that mug open and you can't go to sleep. That's so you, You're right. That is what I'm telling you. But I'm, I'm going to let you finish your point. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's an excellent point. I mean, because at, the, at, the, at some point when you stop laughing, and you, when you stop laughing, you look, I got a sister-in-law that died of a heroin overdose. Mm. I mean, her heart exploded. You couldn't take it anymore. No. And, you know, I, I've never thought about that in the context of a Dave Chappelle joke. And I think that um, I think that is very important. 
Uh, I think it's a legitimate conversation. Uh, you know, but I also think that it's going to require more heavy lifting than we ever imagined. And I agree. It's, it's sad. It's sad because the comedians, the entertainers, the, all these people, they have more of an impact on our people than our so-called representatives. Yeah. You right. So it, it, so it, it, it's, 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 I, I just think that it, w- what you have just said on this day, Spill thing, I think that is very, very important. I think all of us, I'm going to uh, wrestle with that this evening. And uh, uh, as usual, I appreciate for you guys having me. Thank you. I appreciate y'all. I appreciate Alexander. Always a friend of the show. Y'all know who it is. Y'all know that's Alexander. Y'all know who it is. So um, I appreciate having you on, bro. I mean, that's just what it is. And y'all know this next person is a friend of the show, too. So come on, 310, what's going on? What up, y'all? What up, y'all? This is Antonio. What's up, Yvette? We know. <laughs> hey, I just wanted to say that I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, you know, I know y'all have been talking about Tyrone Biggins and how he should have been dealt with. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and they don't understand the reason why Chappelle's character is so problematic is first of all it was it was the key character that branded his, his show you can admit that to yourself or not but more importantly than that when you connect his character to the color of law you understand his character was created to gut our race mm. meaning fundamentally and in, in event that white stuff around his mouth wasn't chalk or ashes that was cocaine. Oh, that was, that was crack. That was cocaine. Office. That's what I believe it was. You know, they, they said, you know, even when you look at the costume, they said, take the sugar and put it on your mouth. Like that. That's cocaine. Now, what I see as a bigger problem is, you're chuckling at this, and I'm saying it to the younger caller, uh, I think he's younger than me, makes black people politics happen. And I don't think you really understand that. When you're at UCLA or Stanford, or Harvard, you're not there just for you to get a million dollars. Mm. You are a beacon for the rest of the race. So when you are in your dorm room chuckling at Tyrone Biggs, the white person that might have never met a black person before, is learning that it's okay to chuckle to. Mm. And I feel like it's, it, 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 it's almost like we lost a sense of of what black America is. We all want to say black America is not monolithic. When you pull up the racial gap map, black people are in Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama, Texas, and they're sprinkled in the Midwest. We are monolith, socially and by wealth. If you quirky, you probably an outsider. If you quirky like Chappelle, you probably don't represent the center of black America. And that's okay. But there's a reason they're giving you a show. Mm. There's a reason that you're getting a show. Again, go to Netflix and watch my documentary, Freeway Cracking the System. Get past the Freeway Rick Ross part and look at the Iran Contra. Look at these Nicaraguans that have never been on camera. And we went to Monaco and got them, saying that the government was at least complicit in allowing cocaine to be sold in the same community created by the color of law. And you think it's funny. Mm. And you validate a man who will put that on mainstream TV. I said this on your page. I just want to share this, and I'll leave it at this the little section of what I, what I wrote so everybody gets context of what I said. I said this. I said this. Fire that crackhead character was for white, not black. That mm. crackhead character that David Chappelle was making was for white, not black, to laugh at the black life, racial covenant, redlining, and crack creating. Quirky, elitist blacks, distanced from blacks, push this on our community as well. People who play the line of being palatable for white innuendo about Ooh. black life. Key and Peel ain't too far different. Oh! And I'm talking about this thread that we will read, has made clear why professional work environments have become so hard for black people with respect for black life. We have filled these spaces with vapid and disrespectful laughter at the blackness white people created with a hundred years of oppression. Mm. People are still here, twisting their twisting their thumbs, and can't explain to me why this crackhead character was okay. So I know they laughed and, and high-fived at work and at school with whites that wanted to know if it was okay to laugh at 
type on business. Mm. The last thing I'll say to you is to leave it at this. Imagine the skin of the Holocaust. People dying in internment camps. And, and, how, and you know, how they fell down and all that. You better imagine me because science don't ain't doing it. <laughs> uh, thank you thank you tone toss as always thank you now nah, you're right like ain't nobody that's that's us like and we have to question ourselves because we're in a very serious time like this ain't no time to play like a lot of people and that's what i think this do for self stuff is they playing i'm not playing i want i'm, I'm gonna go to four four one four four one four tell me what's your name to where you calling from hello hey four one four what's going on hello? Hey, it's Demetrius. How you doing? Pretty good. How about you? I'm good. I got a little story to tell you. Tell me a story. Um, and, and it's wrapped around. And, and it's wrapped around that whole Chappelle thing. Okay. This happened 2017 when I was up in one of my criminal justice courses before I finished my degree. Okay. This we have to do like a skit or whatever. And like a project, and we have to get up in front of the classroom. Okay. Now, there's only two blocks up in there, and the rest of the class, the other 30 students, was like white. Mm -hmm. This white boy got up there, and he put on that crack-headed skit oh. of David Chappelle with all the white stuff around his mouth. Mm. And you know what, like, as they got played, what the white kids started doing, started laughing at it. Mm -hmm. And me and the other black boy looked at each other like, what is they laughing at? How is this funny? And then he, then he just replayed it and replayed it. And I sit up there and ask, I'm like, why do you keep on replaying this? I'm like, I don't see anything funny about this. And my thing is, how can people chuckle at something like that? And that is African-American pain that a lot of us, and that even their families, have experienced that. And then also, too, a lot of these do for sufferers that sit up there and say, oh, um, you just got to pour yourself up for the blue shafts. When you sit up there and look at Milwaukee back in the 1930s and the 1920s, it was ran by mobsters and Italians that came here, and they didn't let blacks build a lot. Blacks tried to build roadways. Yeah, always. Open up um, mm -hmm. parking um, roadways downtown and different parking garages, and they was all blocked. So all the stuff that they keep on saying that we need to do is already has been tried and I just, I don't understand that, but I just want to definitely get in that story. Thank um, you. Um, Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Carla. I, no, I appreciate it because the thing about, the thing that I appreciate so much about your call is that nobody thinks when, 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 it, when these do for self was taught, nobody ever thinks that like what y'all saying has already been tried. Like nobody knows enough history to tell them like what y'all talking about has already been tried. You just don't know enough to know that what you talking about has been tried. And so nobody, so I appreciate you saying that. And yeah, like, how do you feel when you get all these people like laughing at the crack? Ha, 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 look at him. He's, 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 he's do crack cocaine and all this thing. <laughs> all right, 646, I'm coming to you. What's your name? Where you calling from? You there, 646? Hello? Hey, how you doing? What's your name? Where you calling from? Hi, Yvette. My name is Shay. I'm calling from New York. Okay, what's going on? First, I want to say I enjoy your show, and I agree with everything you be saying 100%. Speak up a little bit for and me. I, just want to... I said I agree with everything you be saying 100%. Thank you. And what pisses, what pisses me off, Yvette, is that I myself be trying to explain it to friends and family about what's going on with immigration. And I have, like, a male friend, and I'll be telling him about it. And he felt, he says to me, like, well, why should we be mad about people that also want to come to this country and, you know, make a difference for themselves? You know, if, 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 if people need to do what they need to do, then why should we be upset with them? And I'm like, hello? Are you not understanding <laughs> that we should be getting the benefits that they get in? Like, why would you be rooting for a group that don't even care about us? I don't get it. And aren't you, the, aren't you the same one that don't got a job? And the reason why is because they're taking all the jobs. You don't have, you don't have a job and you advocate for somebody outside your group. Did y'all hear that? I, I, I don't understand it either. I, be, I mean, I, I, I get so pissed off because I'm like, if you think about it, 20, 30 years ago, it was not like this. Now, yeah, of course, racism always been. But you do remember the time when it was just black and white. 
Now you got white on top of us and other group of people on top of us. How are we going to win? We're not. No. We're not like that. We're not. See, the thing is, Carla, let me just say this. Like, we don't understand what citizenship is supposed to mean. Like, the, we look, we're like, well, he's just a human like I'm a human. And we are. No, 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 no. Shut your stupid. No. Citizenship is supposed to mean something. Now, it's never meant anything for us. But we're at a space now where undocumented immigrants are being advocated for the past year. The main story has been undocumented immigrants and Trump and Mueller and Russia. Those are the top two stories that we've seen. Think about we're drinking lead water and those have been the top two stories. If you do not advocate for yourself, nobody's going to advocate for you. None of these people advocated when, when mass incarceration happened. None of these people advocated when, when food stamps got... They have not advocated for us as a community. And what I want to... Before I'm going to let you finish, Carl, let me say this. You have to understand the resources are not infinite. They're finite. And resources have to be prioritized. As people in this country who have not only been shut out, but who have not gotten anything. You shut us out of what it means to be American. Now you want to bring these people in and give them America to dream. And we have to say, no, you don't. And if you don't get that, I don't know what we can do. But let me just let you say the last word, Carla, before I move on. I'm sorry. Let's get me riled up. As I stated, Yvette, I'm from New York. And if you think about, when you speak about Dave Chappelle, as far as the, um, him doing the skit as a crackhead, you know, New York, I, I'm quite sure, uh, or other states, absolutely, but New York was crack epidemic in the 80s. Where was, I always be wondering as I float through New York, I'm like, why didn't they do justification at this time? Like, why didn't y'all want to come and help the, the, the poor black people in New York then when the crack valves was all over the ground and the freaking abandoned buildings and the big They weren't lot? worried with us. Nobody didn't care then. They still don't care. They still, don't care. they still don't care. They still don't care. They still don't care. Nobody Why cares about us. Like, shall overcome. Nobody cares. Like, this world is so upside down. It seems like, oh, the world just started. No, no. Like, these people have never cared about us. And now y'all trying to make it seem like because of the feminine movement and everything that's going, in, going on, LBGQ, whatever, everybody should be singing and holding hand and singing in harmony. I ain't singing with you nobody. I, I screw your kumbaya. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. I want to move to the next one, but I appreciate Thank you calling you. in. I appreciate your support. Ain't no, cool, ain't no kumbaya over here. Because I understand that. Because I understand the game. I understand that y'all be fighting, talking about kumbaya, but that's not y'all what y'all really up to. 219, I'm coming to you. 219, what's your name? Where you calling from? Hey. What's uh, going on? This is West Rumble from, uh, I'm from Indiana. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, I was actually going to comment on uh, what you said earlier about um, how black people were shut out of all this stuff. Because the South won. The South won during the Civil War. South, South did won. win. South won it all. It was Andrew Jackson. Because honestly, Lincoln was sitting there. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to sit there and praise Lincoln because Lincoln is uh, just as big of a racist as everyone else back then. Because let's face it, everyone was racist. You had the uh, abolitionists that were just sitting there trying to free the slaves so that they could ship them off back to Africa because they didn't want them around. Mm. I mean, you you have abolitionists sitting there tr just trying to get rid of things. Abolitionists in, uh, 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 in Pennsylvania, what were they doing? The Quakers. They were mm. sitting there going, uh, getting them from the border, bringing them up. Where were they going? To New York. They were moving the black people from the south up to New York. Were they putting them in uh, Pennsylvania? No. They were trying to get them out of their territory and get them out to New York so that they could get them on some ships and send them off or set, put them in uh, some factory and uh, so that we could sit there and uh, use them or uh, use black people for, uh, for again, cheap slave labor. Even though it's not slave labor no more because we're paying you, but we're also going to be rack having you rack up a bunch of debt. Uh -oh. And it was Andrew Jackson, a, dem uh, a Democrat, back in those days, well, he originally was a Democrat, then he switched over to being a Republican, and was with uh, Lincoln's, vice, or as vice president, and then what happened is, when Lincoln was uh, uh, assassinated, he sat there and said, hey, Democrats, all these Southerners that sat there and went against the Union, or Andrew Go Johnson, ahead. sorry, Andrew Johnson, he, he went against the Union, but you know what, we are going to punish you. We aren't going to sit there and hurt you at all. 
we are not going to do anything. Actually, we're going to bring you in. You just say that we never left. Tell me that you never left, and we'll be fine, and then you'll be put back in charge. You slave owners, or well, former slave owners. Thank you, Carl. You, you're right. Thank you, Carl. I'm going to let you go. I got I to gotta keep it moving. But you're right. Like, what happened? What the call, Part of what the caller says is, like, what happened after Reconstruction is that we just put, you just gave the slavers, you, you talk about, well, the, sl the slaves were freed a long time ago. No, they weren't. You put the slavers back in charge after Reconstruction. That was, that was the deal. Just read color line. Oh, you can look it up on your own. You basically said, well, the federal government, as part of this deal, we're going to move out. Y'all can have y'all away with these black people. And they basically reinstituted slavery. That's what happened. Anybody who tells you anything else is just basically lying to you. I don't know how else to tell you that. And it's just like, even in terms of when you talk about allies, you say, well, we're all African. Think about what Alexander just said about us being sold. You are forming an alliance with the people who sold you into this, into this mess? The people, the people who showed you and made money off of it didn't get to come over here and say, hey, we the same. We still, we all the same. We all in this together. You better leave. Oh, my God. Okay, I'm just trying to keep this moving. Let's make the calls concise because I got to. I gotta keep it moving. Seven five seven seven five seven. I'm coming to you. What's your name? Where you calling from? What's up, Evet? This is Otis again. What's going on, Otis? Yeah, it's a little bit more than that. I put this stuff up all the time on my page. We don't have to go all the way back to 1865 or the Reconstruction, but you're right about Friedman Bank, uh, Johnson pulling out of the South after uh, Reconstruction, allowing the Citizen Council in the red shirts to go in and run black people off, literally, literally attack black elected officials on the, under the Capitol building in Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, all of them. We can go even further. Mm. Amy Barber and all of them, current people, people who just retired out of Congress, what, eight, nine, ten years ago? Uh -huh. They did the same thing in the South through the 40, 45 to the 1950. But I'm going to tell you another one. You talk about uh, uh, systemic racism. I would, I would, am a veteran. I literally had to go 35 miles away from my home in Yorktown, Virginia, mm -hmm. get a veteran certified homeowner mm. to come, uh, a home inspector, to inspect a home I was buying after I put down more than 30% for it right next to my mother's house because the local bank didn't want me to have that house. Wow. The finances and everything. So I'm telling you, systemic racism is not only just a government federal. I'm telling you it's local, too. As a matter of fact, most of American yeah, whites that are suffering now are suffering because banks are no longer locally owned. They don't mm. have access to the cousin or the uncle who's on the board. The banks are all national now. Yeah. That's why you see the rise of the backlash from poor white America. Because you can't just have your uncle co-sign for you. Anymore. Yeah, don't work as well no have more. You to have more money. Okay. I like what you do. And the other thing is, these black people that keep coming on here talking about how they can work around something on their own. If you don't understand that without wealth, you cannot build anything. All you can do is be in a rat cage. You cannot be the system that is designed to oppress you because you have no wealth. A Thank you. Job Thank you, Otis. Income I is not wealth. I appreciate it. Thank you for calling. I'm trying to get, but yeah, but not only is a job not wealth, we don't we don't understand when wealth was built and under what circumstances. We don't understand timing. So you think you can? You think you think as a delusional black person that you can go and build the same wealth that the United States government built because of a war that was going on and to fight communism you think you can go build that same thing on your own because you are disturbed you need some help anyway I'm going to 775 what's your name and where you calling from hello can you hear me I can hear you just fine hello I can hear okay. you um I am uh Lance uh Caller from the Pacific Northwest of Portland. Okay. I'll make this quick. This is three, Thank this you, three points. Uh, John Lewis uh, and many of our civil rights icons that are in Congress right now has basically turned into our Robert Mugabe's. Oh. Meaning Robert Mugabe, he, he did a lot of great things for Zimbabwe to get them from under the rule of whites. But then he stayed, um, it, it, it's kind of like the, 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 the savior basically ended up turning into the bad guy. Mm. 
mm. which is how they ended up with their problems today. Two, the do for yourself. Um, um, Trump brought up the nuclear family, which I was really interested, I was kind of fascinated to hear because I haven't heard any type of reference to the nuclear family in at least 20 years. And this is something where the do for self and how black people thought that this type of infrastructure would apply to them. And the mm-hmm. do for selfers say, well, I'm the nuclear family, so everything that applies to white America will apply to me. Yeah. Not realizing that that, that, that nuclear family, it, it's, it, white people can have a nuclear family because when they go to the banks and they deal with the infrastructure, they're dealing with people who look like them. Uh, black media, Michael Jackson, he, he made this album and he had some epithets on it. And one of these epithets was the K word, if you know what, if you know where I'm going with. And for those out there who don't understand it, everyone has some type of epithet that applies to them. And he used the K word, uh, uh, referring to Jews and they had enough power over their media to tell him he had to pull well, that well. out. Well, we don't, we don't, we don't have, we don't have any media. But I, I, I mean, we don't, we don't have media at all. But I, I want to thank you for your call, call. I got to keep it moving because I gotta, I, I want to get through a few more calls. Um, I'm, I'm gonna try to get to two more calls before we finish here. Um, I'm gonna go to a six zero. What's your name? Where you calling from? Let's try to keep it uh, short because I'm trying to get through some people. Hey, how you doing? Hey. How you doing, Yvette? Pretty good. How about you? From Connecticut. Hey. Doing great. Doing great. Um, love your show as usual. Thank you. A uh, few points. I'm going to hit it and quit it. Uh-huh, I appreciate you. So basically, as native black descendants of slaves, we pay our taxes. When we pay our taxes, we are fundamentally funding our own abuse at the hands of our own government. A government, which by the way, happens to be really people. People who are set against us. All right. By principle, and also indeed, because you just spoke about it policies, the historical record tells us this, and then on top of that, so basically you're saying that it's okay to chase pipe dreams of American pie and back and sit back and watch white supremacists organize themselves. This is what we're doing. (laughs) We got to get focused and get organized. That's our biggest issue. We don't unite. And we're not focused. Well, I, I mean, I mean, you're, 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 I'm sorry. You're, you're giving us the you're giving us the tools to do it, but that's the one thing we don't do. Well, well, well I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try to move to the next call real quick, but I think. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate you calling in. But I think the reason we don't get organized is because we have do for self for saying you don't need to get organized. Like we have do for self for saying you don't need to do all that. All you gotta do is do this one thing. All you gotta do is get your credit together. All you got to do is work a little bit harder. All you got to do is work when you get home from work. Work from work from 9, 9 p.m. to 10 to, to 2 a.m. That's all you got to do. All you got to do is 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 joy is is do this cryptocurrency thing. So part of the reason that we can't get our stuff together is cuz we have a lot of these people who are just telling lies. And so it's very hard to get ourselves together and understand what it means to be a collective if that's what you're dealing with. I think the next call is probably going to be my last one. Um, 313, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, Yvette, this is Keisha. How you doing? I'm, I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Hey, I'm hanging in there one day at a time. That's what Listen, you got to do. I've been reading this book, Color of Law. Good. Thank you. Woo! Yeah. Yeah, there's a section in there that talks about the local tax. And I just want to read this little piece in there. Go ahead. Blew my wig back. Blew your wig back? Taken in isolation, we can easily dismiss such devices as aberration. But when we consider them as a whole, we can see that they were part of a national system by which the state and local government supplemented federal efforts to maintain the status of African Americans at a lower caste with housing segregation, preserving the badges and incidents of slavery. Now, when I read that, I said, we're walking around with this scarlet letter 
And then we got these people telling us, well, girl, if you just get your money right and if yep. you just go on out there and get that Bitcoin, you're going to be straight. Yep. But we got a badge on us. We got a badge on us. And then that Dave Chappelle skit on uh, Tyrone Bingham, I'm a recovered addict. And I'm proud that I went through that struggle because it may be the woman that I am today. Uh-huh. And the things that we don't want to look at, like you talk about the cost, the blackness, we may have a mother, a grandmother, a daughter, a cousin that's strung out on crack, and here we are laughing at that. Exactly. Say, you find it, you got it. Thanks for letting me share tonight. No, I want to, I want to, I wish I could come and Thank you. I want to thank you, sister, and I want to. I want to thank you for calling in, and I want to tell you. You said you're a recovery addict. I want to thank you and tell you that I congratulate you on your sobriety. I congratulate you on your sobriety. You in here reading color law, and I can't imagine what you've been through in terms of coming from that to this. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank all the people who have come through some stuff and and are still here to talk and be with me on this show and everything like that. So I want to thank y'all, and and you know I let me just tell y'all, I appreciate everybody. Like I I appreciate y'all. Y'all, you know, I don't think y'all appreciate how much y'all appreciate the Breaking Brown family. Um, but I think we have to ask ourselves what kind of people we are. If you're the person that laughs at the person who's on drugs, who's been on drugs. If you're the person who is laughing at, you know, the, the, the crackhead when you walk. If you're a person who's selling subprimes. Then I think if you're a person who's saying, well, brother, if you, all you got to do to beat the system is you got to get this crypto. All you got to do, let me, hey, hey, let me tell you. All you got to do. Is playing the rules. One of the things that Monique said in the last interview that was so powerful to me. She said, next time. Everybody tells you about, well, not this time, but the next time. It ain't never the next time. And the reason it's so powerful, because I don't even tell you the people I talk to. And everybody tells me that. Well, they always say, like, well, we're going to hook you up next time. We're going to get you on the rebound. And it never happens. So we have to decide, decide collectively. <coughs> is this our rebound? When is it our turn to be citizens? We haven't been citizens in the country that our parents and grandparents and grandparents were born. And who are we going to be in that context? Now, I've said it again, and I'm going to keep saying it because now is the time for you to choose. It's time to choose sides because it's about to get real, real. And it's time to choose sides. I want to know what side you're going to be on. You will either be on my side or that other side that's just kind of delusional. You're either going to fight the big dragon in this whole in this in this fight, this David and Goliath, you gon you either gonna fight the big thing or you gonna cop out and call it empowerment. I need to know what side you are going to be on. So before I come back, I might not be here. I'm going to speaking of this book, Color of Law, I'm gonna be in um I'm gonna be in Louisville for um I think I fly out Friday and I'll be there through like Tuesday, I think. I'm gonna meet with the author of this book, Ralph Stein. We're going to talk about some things. We're going to be working with the Angela Project. So I don't think I'm going to be here on Monday. If I can, I don't know what my schedule is going to look like there. I will. I might try to do a show from the hotel room. Um, but that's just, don't, don't hold me to it. But um, I just want to let everybody know that. Please like, please subscribe to the show. Um, and I appreciate all of you being here and everything you do to be here every week and contribute to back black politics. We're going to get this together. We're going to get this. Remember that this is about a political foundation, a political education. And this is something that all of us have to do. It's not just me. Um, so I appreciate hearing from you all in terms too about what you're doing for your own people and your own family and how you're trying to educate them to understand that at a certain point there are some people that might have to be excluded and we're going to have to talk about that exclusion piece because if not they're going to drive you crazy so we got to talk about that piece too um, but um, until next time I'll see you guys soon what's up Breaking Brown family peace out Breaking Brown family get some rest get some sleep and finish your libation <laughs>